Մակս պատիվից արգոբիտ գինոտ պրովեսոր պիտեր լեվենիս լեկցիա, ռոմելից գախլավտ չվենի ունյերսետիս ստումարի, մանուկ է չատարա ռամդենիմ է, շեղվեդրա ռամդենիմ է լեկցիա, ստուտեն տեպտան, դա դղես արիս էրդգարի շեմա� իսետ սակիտխեմ սրեղուրիցա մասուրի պիզիսի էվոպիս հեղնեպշի։ Ասև է ակտուալ ումի սակիտխեմի, հած ուկավ շիտ դեղա տեղան դեղովաս դա իմ կովրումեպ սրած ընտեմատ հարիս ուկեղսեն է բատ թանամետրով � Չիկագոս ունիվերսիտետիս պիլոսովիս դոքտորի, ամջամած մողաց է ուրստ է խասիս ունիվերսիտետ չի, թալասիս ունիվերսիտետիս պրոպեսորին կախլավտ, Չիկագոս ունիվերսիտետ չի, միտեր լեմինիս խենձվանելի � Արմատեմիտ մողած է ոպս թանամետրովիս ես կամուջանիլի մեծնիրի եկոնոմիստի դա աս տղեսաց ծագյան դիդի դա միշնելովանի վունցի ապիսխի է ռոզորձ ուլևարս դա ռոզորձ անայիտիկոս։ Պրոպեսորի բիտեր լևինի կախլավտ � Հունեպաս մոնձեմ թե մեր կագացնովտ ամ սակիտխեպ սամեց իրո ինտերես է վիսպերոմակս, խետ ոլ ուբաշի, այս արիս բենքինք, Եկոնոմիկ պրինսպլս, Մայքրո են մակրը, Կավեմենտ հեգուլեիշն, այն բիզնես օվանիզեիշն Why don't we learn from history? Macroeconomic politics, Rato, first of all, history will come to the bit. As a number of skitharits, I will be able to buy Europe's economic and commercial base, financial crisis, the pharmacist was a doctor, Professor Lewis. I'm honored to announce your presentation, so welcome to the last speaker. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm accustomed to uh, thanking my introducer for the quality of his introduction. Uh, in this particular case, uh, if I did so, I uh, run the risk of having you not believe anything else I would, uh, would tell you, uh, because my Georgian is not quite up to standard. So I hope you'll forgive me for that. But judging by the length of your introduction, thank you very much. I. Uh, I'm really delighted to be here and I thank you all for taking time out of your busy schedule uh, to come and listen to me. Uh, I uh, want to thank also the university for the invitation to come here. I've been here for four days, uh, I have one more day tomorrow, and I've really had a very good time in this uh, beautiful city uh, and getting to uh, meet a whole lot of new people, make some new friends, and I hope to be back one day soon. Uh, my uh, topic today is a uh, topic that is more interesting in this day, at this time in our history than maybe it has been at any time in recent history. Uh, and in fact, it consists of a question about macroeconomic policy. Why don't we learn from history? Uh, the question uh, presumes some uh, facts, it presumes that we don't, so I first have to establish that fact. And uh, I will spend some time doing that. And in the process, I think, hope to motivate my discussion by telling you a little about my own personal odyssey, my own personal journey. When we ask the question, why don't we learn from history? Who is the we after all, right? Societies in a, in a literal sense, don't learn or unlearn or know anything. It's the people inside of the societies 
who know things. What we all know, what society knows, is in some sense a reflection of what we all learn. So I uh, hope you will indulge me if I tell you a little bit about my own journey uh, under the assumption that it is not that untypical. It's sort of we learn from our own individual experiences about the experiences of others. I won't answer the question immediately. I will first try to establish the, uh, the, the case in, that is being presumed, namely that we don't learn from history or there are instances where we don't learn from history. And then, hopefully at the end, I will come to an answer in three parts. Uh, and then, hopefully, we'll have a little bit of time for discussion. Be happy to take questions and comments. Um, the uh, substance of what I have to say today, much of the substance of what I have to say today, can be found in an article that I wrote recently, I think published in 2009 in a publication of, from the uh, Foundation for Economic Education. The, the free publication is called The Freeman. Uh, you can get it online at fee.org. They didn't pay me for that endorsement. They got it for free. Um, no pun intended. The, uh, the article is entitled Recycling Discredited Ideas. And it features predominantly that gentleman there, some of you may recognize, is the famous British economist John Maynard Keynes, the inventor of macroeconomics and the man who gave his name to Keynesian economics. The history from which we do not learn is in, involves the implementation of Keynesian economics. Keynes was a man who could write in 1935, in a letter to the very famous Scottish playwright George Bernard Shaw, I am putting the finishing touches on a book that will revolutionize the way that people think about economics. He was supremely confident of his ability to persuade not only those close to him, but the entire economics profession. So we might as well begin by asking the question, who was this man? How did he have such confidence and how was he so persuasive? I answer those questions really by saying, in order to understand Keynes, you have to understand who and what he was, where he was and when he was. The fact of the matter is that Keynes was one of the most persuasive writers and speakers of his age, maybe of any age. He was an incredibly charismatic individual, very tall, uh, very eloquent, capable of incredible impromptu persuasive rhetoric, uh, and he was very, very well connected. In addition, he was the head of the Cambridge Department of Economics at the time that he was most influential. Cambridge was the place after the First World War, in the, between the, in the interwar period and certainly after the Second World War for a while, where economics was being made. It was the center of the world of economics. It was the place where the economic journal was published and Keynes was the editor. So he was the head of the Cambridge Department of Economics, the editor of the economic journal. Nothing that he said or wrote was not published. He was at the center of where economic opinion was being made. And it, this was a time in the interwar period when the world was ripe, when the time was ripe for making of a revolution after all. It was the time in the middle of the Great Depression. England had, was in its second decade of economic malaise, unlike America, which had the roaring 20s, a time when uh, economic growth and, uh, and, uh, and economic innovation uh, was uh, causing the creation of value and fortunes creativity. In England, nothing like that was happening. England had attempted to go back to the gold standard, had precipitated substantial 
uh, unemployment, uh, in the power of the trade unions, and uh, this was just uh, aggravated, exaggerated by the advent of the Great Depression, which became a worldwide depression. And by the time Keynes published the general theory in 1936, the world uh, commitment to the ideas uh, uh, that we would call a, uh, the ideas that uh, went into the description of what we would call a capitalist economy uh, was waning. You might say that capitalism had lost its will. It had lost its ability to uh, explain itself. In other words, it appeared as though capitalism had failed. Uh, the Russian Revolution had occurred in 1917 and the Soviets were busy on an alternative uh, method of planning economic activity that appeared to be superior. So what Keynes uh, thought he was doing is that he was saving the world for capitalism, offering them another variant of what the capitalist uh, model would look like by bringing a leader, a knowledgeable leader, a government led by himself to basically support uh, what might otherwise be an unstable, uh, rudderless free market economy. Keynes was, in other words, a statesman, an orator, a professor, an essayist, a polemist. He was a prophet in a time of doom, a man who was to, to, to whom everybody looked for salvation. We can understand that, and in understanding that you will understand my own personal odyssey, because although I was born in 1948, I inherited some of the admiration uh, for this man, and by the time I became an undergraduate economist, uh, the world was firmly embedded in the embrace of uh, Keynesian economics. The new orthodoxy was Keynesian economics. I assume some of you know how that happened in the way in which the ideas were first propagated within the universities, then uh, reached the uh, wider public and ultimately came to be uh, infiltrate the uh, halls of economic policy in America from about 1960 onwards. So that by the time of the Nixon administration, Time magazine could quote him as saying, we are all Keynesians now. So when I went to university, um, I was, it was a time, 1965, of the height of the new orthodoxy, this new orthodoxy of Keynesian economics. I was indeed, I admit freely, completely seduced by Keynesian economics. Uh, because of the appeal of Keynesian economics was substantial. If you're young and idealistic uh, and you want to fix the world, who is not young and I who is not idealistic and want to fix the world when you're young, right? Uh, Keynes offered a method and he offered an appealing answer to the uh, suspicion that a young person studying economics might have that there is a huge element of psychology and uncertainty and uh, uh, variable groundedness in the, uh, in the world. And the Keynesian system seemed to explain all of these things. Uh, so by the time I went, to, by the time I was in already my uh, you know, second or third year as an undergraduate, I already was an expert in Keynesian economics. I had read the general theory a couple of times and I was absolutely uh, taken in by that, um, by that philosophy. The market is okay, but it needs to be helped in a world that is characterized by the dark forces of time and ignorance. Those were Keynes's words. Um, at the time, I was, uh, were a little later, I started attending an honors seminar by my teacher in South Africa, the Austrian school economist Ludwig Lachmann. And while I was in that uh, honors seminar, I began to read widely and I came across the work of Milton Friedman. And uh, I found this work incredibly interesting, incredibly annoying, incredibly frustrating. Uh, Friedman was not a sophisticated writer, but he was an incredibly compelling logician, an com incredibly compelling uh, 
writer and uh, discusser of, of, of issues. It's just that his, the positions that he took appeared to me in my very being to be wrong. But I couldn't exactly say how they were wrong. And it, it was a lesson at how long it takes to proceed from that point when somebody offers you a position in which you firmly believe and have some emotion invested up to the point where you ultimately realize that, are right, that they are right and are able to abandon your, your initial commitment. Uh, I, it took me a long time to go through that. Um, and uh, I came to Friedman first by reading about his economic policy. And only later uh, did I come to the, his ideas about monetarism. By the time I went to the University of Chicago, I already knew about monetarism. I had done an honors thesis on Milton Friedman's monetary theory, uh, but I was not yet completely convinced. I had still believed fundamentally in the principles of Keynesian economics. Monetarism, as you probably know, uh, would make the argument that the market economy really needs no help. That's sort of the background to, uh, the, monetary, to the monetarist story. Uh, that basically the best thing that the central bank can do is to try and not get in the way, to try and not make things worse. So to, uh, to more or less act like a computer according to a rule, the monetarist rule of monetary policy. And of course Friedman and his colleagues Schwartz and Kagan and many others did a lot of empirical work to try and back up their propositions. So the market needs no help. Do me a favor. Don't do me any favors. It just makes things worse. Uh, and uh, it's with that really that I arrived at uh, the University of Chicago and gradually began to change my mind. It's, uh, it's quite an experience to have gone through the Chicago School Economics PhD program. You meet a lot of people, arrogant people, uh, who do not suffer fools gladly. And uh, it took me a while. Uh, but basically, I, I began to um, digest and come to believe in the idea that uh, we should uh, give the market the benefit of the doubt. That on the basis of uh, historical evidence, the market does work. The uh, Chicago approach or the Austrian approach or any general principled approach to free markets does not make the claim does not make the claim that the market will bring up utopia, uh, as sometimes other critics would allege. It's not that the market is uh, perfect, because life is not perfect. The world is full of imperfections. So uh, the whole point, though, is that although it cannot be theoretically proven that the market will always get things right, it is the sum total of our general experience that market forces are responsible both for the uh, achievement of prosperity and for the achievement of a high degree of liberty. And, uh, and we can show that in many ways. It's, it's part of an experiential knowledge rather than of a kind of a book knowledge. And, we, and at Chicago, I learned about the background economic principles that support that basic conclusion. In particular, many, many examples that show that government intervention in economic life is extraordinarily difficult to achieve your goals and always has unintended consequences. And most importantly, what I learned from that experience, I arrived in America in 1972, September of 1972. America was in the middle of a, of a recession. Uh, it was right before the uh, formation of OPEC and the, the oil price crisis. Um, and uh, it was the time also that uh, right be before the beginning of the experimentation with the uh, easy money policy. And uh, I, uh, by the time I left Chicago in 1976, I was familiar with Milton Friedman's basic ideas as he had offered them in his uh, presidential address to the American Economic Association in 1969 where he talks about the role of monetary policy, as I said a moment ago, as to not really get in the way. In particular, that monetary policy should not aim 
at trying to permanently reduce interest rates. In particular, it should not aim it, it should rather follow the market rather than try to lead or guide the market. And perhaps as important, if not more important, monetary policy should not try to reduce the level of unemployment. There is a natural rate of unemployment in the economy that will tend to emerge uh, as a result of the uh, supply and demand for labor as people look for jobs and employers look for people to fill jobs. Uh, there will be a natural rate of unemployment down to which the economy will settle if, if we allow the labor market to work as efficiently as possible. And any attempt by monetary policy or fiscal policy supporting monetary policy to try and reduce that level of unemployment below that will subsequently only produce inflation. Friedman directly addressed the question of the Phillips curve. The Phillips curve said that if only we would be prepared to put up with a little bit more inflation, we can reduce unemployment. In other words, unemployment and inflation are trade-offs, are permanent trade-offs. They are both painful and they are both undesirable, but we, if we, they become more so as we have more of one and less of the other. So we can maybe buy a little bit less unemployment by tolerating a little bit more inflation. Friedman said that was based on a false assumption, on the assumption that, impl that inflation and unemployment were indeed alternatives, and that there is no long-term trade-off between inflation and un unemployment. The attempt to reduce unemployment by boosting the economy and tolerating inflation will perhaps succeed, not always, but sometimes, will succeed in the short run. But in the long run, as people absorb the new money and prices start to rise, the level of unemployment will rise along with it, so that in the long run what we will have is both higher inflation and higher unemployment. And indeed, if you want to get back to a situation of lower inflation, the only other way you'll be able to do that is by increasing unemployment. In other words, by increasing, uh, by, by, but you reduce unemployment by, re by provoking a recession. Um, this was a very sober message, and it was a message that in 1969, everybody who didn't agree with him was bound to reject and simply discard. Um, by the time I came to Dallas in 1979, it appeared as though Friedman, by that time Friedman had already won the Nobel Prize in 1976. Come the la later part of the 1970s, they began to emerge out of the statistics, uh, the aggregate statistics began to emerge the conclusion that what we were getting in America was higher inflation and higher unemployment. Something that we hadn't seen before, pretty much ever. Certainly double digit inflation wasn't something that Americans tolerated very easily. And this of course paved the way for the Reagan revolution in America and the Thatcher revolution in, in England. Um, but it, it was so ununus unusual actually that the Americans coined, made a new word for it. They called it stagflation. Perhaps you've seen it. Stag, stagnation at the same time as inflation. This idea somehow that inflation is a stimulus that brings you prosperity had been challenged. Challenged by the evidence. Challenged by the history. Challenged by the experience. So that by the time I came to Dallas in 1979 with the election of Ronald Reagan the next year, it appeared to me that if Keynesianism wasn't dead, at least it was on life support. The Keynesians appeared to be in retreat. It appeared to me to be a case, a rare case, of the victory of correct ideas in an environment in which the ideas were allowed to compete and in which indeed it appeared as though we had learned from the history that Keynesianism doesn't work. Uh, I couldn't imagine that we would, have, we would ever go back to the embrace of these ideas. I want to be clear that it's not as if 
Keynesian economics was obviously, in some obvious way, logically or empiric empirically wrong. Milton Friedman himself said that Keynes in some ways was a very good economist. He offered what appeared to be a plausible and appealing hypothesis. So it was a perfectly good hypothesis, the only problem was it was wrong. It was wrong not because it couldn't have been right, it was wrong because it wasn't right. It didn't describe the world as it was. The world might be, have been like that. It might have been that the, that the market economy was inherently unstable, and it might be that an inherently unstable economy could be stabilized by government policy. It's not unthinkable that the world might be like that. But what we apparently had learned from history was that the world was not like that. That indeed, if you tried, for a number of reasons that you could then explain, to implement Keynesian policy, that in the long run, what you would get is a failure. So, that was what I thought pretty much from my Chicago training. The icing on the cake, as it were, was the rediscovery uh, in my early years at the University of Texas at Dallas uh, of Austrian economics. I was uh, fortunate as an undergraduate to have been taught by uh, Ludwig Lachmann, who was an Austrian capital theorist, and went off, I doubly fortunate then, to the University of Chicago, so that I am uh, a rare, and I dare say, uh, probably endangered species, uh, in that uh, there are, as far as I know, only two living Austrian Chicagoans. Two living people who both count themselves as Austrian and went to the University of Chicago. Uh, that may make me weird uh, or valuable, depending upon your point of view. Uh, but it, uh, from my perspective, has enabled me to get the best of these two alternative ways of looking at the world. The Austrians provided an added uh, perspective, the work of, of Lachmann, of Ludwig von Mises, of Friedrich Hayek, in that they uh, drew attention to the uh, perspective of the Austrians on central planning. There is a long and uh, complex literature on the analysis and examination of central planning in socialist economies and uh, how uh, sort of from a theoretical and empirical point of view one should expect them to turn out. And uh, I, I won't go into the details but uh, some of which is probably familiar to you at this university that uh, central planning is a hopeless exercise particularly Mises offers the critique of socialism because it doesn't have the necessary inputs into the knowledge of the planners that have to come from the markets. Planning without markets turns out to be a, a, a basically like trying to steer a boat without a rudder. Uh, you, you're just at sea without any way to maneuver. You don't have any prices by which to judge your performance, by which to make decisions on how, how most efficiently to produce things. So there's a fundamental knowledge problem that uh, prevents rational economic calculation. The uh, critique of central planning can be applied also to a lesser degree perhaps to the notion, to the tasks that are faced by the central bank. The emergence of central banking was something that was very critically analyzed by Ludwig von Mises when he was advisor to the government in Austria and to the emerging inflation in Europe before he was driven out. So uh, I got to another dimension sort of on the whole process, the whole uh, critique of the Keynesian system from an Austrian perspective. The historical record in fact of, of central banking, both according to the monetarists and according to an Austrian approach, were not good at all, were pretty abysmal, pretty bad. Also, even if the central bank had the knowledge to apply to achieve its goals, to, uh, to apply the tools and achieve its goals, there is the problem that it is most, that the power that it has would most likely be abused uh, by its uh, proximity to the center of power, to political power. Central banks are created usually, supported almost always by politicians, and although they sometimes are intended to be independent, they almost always become 
the instrument of the, of the politicians, who use them as a way to finance the projects that they uh, want to finance in order to advance their careers, in order to benefit the interests that support them. So there's a tr tremendous danger in uh, centralized monetary uh, uh, planning and in, in using centralized monetary planning to try and manipulate inflation and unemployment. The Austrians were somewhat critical of, of Friedman's rule. They didn't really deny uh, the basic truths that monetarism had come out with, but they said that it certainly was not the whole story. Uh, that it was only the beginning of the story. That uh, basically Friedman's uh, hope that you could somehow legislate a monetary rule and expect that the central bank would obey it, especially in a situation in which the political call for the central bank and the politicians to please do something in this crisis was, uh, was uh, a stretch, was not something that on which you could uh, uh, pin your hopes very confidently. So the Austrians were critical of the monetarists for that reason. I actually heard Hayek uh, give that account at a lecture that I was privileged to attend in Johannesburg, South Africa, when one uh, time I was back there visiting. And I asked him about it and he explained that to me. Uh, but then again, there is another reason and that is the Austrian theory of the business cycle. The Austrians believed that the monetarists missed the fundamental explanation of the reason of the failure of Keynesian economics, of the failure of a policy that tries by easy money to keep interest rates low, reduce unemployment, and uh, maybe uh, sacrifice a little bit of inflation. Why that could not succeed, the monetarist story is in terms of the fact that inflation itself causes a recession because inflation actually in the labor market causes the behavior of workers and employers uh, who respond to real wages but not monetary wages at first to increase employment and then to decrease un employment as they realize that the wage that they're getting is actually worth less because of the inflation. So the Austrian story is a labor market story and the, and, excuse me, the monetary story is a labor market story and the Austrians would say that it is only the beginning of the story. So, um, the Austrians add their, uh, an important dimension. And the dimension comes from capital theory, which was the subject of my lectures this week, where they argue that it's not the aggregate demand and supply that determine the level of unemployment, but rather the pattern of demand and the pattern of supply, the structure that they, you have to break down these aggregates into the constituent parts, that these are what we would call today complex adaptive systems. The economy and the productive structure in the economy are complex systems. They are systems that are composed of multiple interacting components that are unpredictable and adaptive. And that when you try and stimulate productive activity, it, it most often entails trying to stimulate or support a particular sector that looks as though it is being particular, particularly productive. So it could be a telecom sector, as in the dot-com boom, or it could be automobiles and uh, financial sector and uh, sec uh, manufacturing sectors that rely on electricity, as in the 1920s, or it could be the housing sector in the 2000s. But one way or another, these, these sectors become overbought, they become over-invested, uh, uh, in a way for which resources are not available for the long term. So the Austrian uh, business cycle story is that, that the stimulation of production creates a capital structure that is unsustainable, a production structure that is unsustainable. It will eventually bust. So the Austrian story of the business cycle, the Austrian theory of the business cycle, does not rely upon the generation of inflation. If by inflation we mean the rise in prices. Because during the 1920s there was an expansion of the money supply, which seemed to produce phenomenal economic growth in America. Uh, in, the, in the 2000s there's been a huge expansion of Federal Reserve reserves, bank reserves, which has not led to an expansion of the money supply or an increase in prices. 
And yet, in each case, we have had a distortion of the capital structure and the precipitation of a crash, of a bust. And this is something that the uh, monetarist model doesn't really predict or cannot handle. So, uh, I end up really that uh, with having learned those lessons, thinking that the world had learned those lessons. Uh, by uh, 1979, what Chicago and Vienna had taught the world seemed to me at least to be decisive. Fast forward to 2008, end of 2007, 2008, the election of a new charismatic president uh, embracing a progressive agenda and all of a sudden people start talking about stimulating the economy, about government spending in order to create jobs, about Keynesian multipliers, and I'm saying to myself, am I dreaming? Don't they remember? So the rumors of the Keynesian demise were evidently greatly exaggerated. And the truth is, of course, that Keynes is back as strong as ever. If you pick up the pages of the New York Times, you will read the inspiring articles of one Paul Krugman, who is a die-hard Keynesian, who is criticizing the government for not stimulating the economy enough, a $1.5 trillion stimulus, according to him, is too little by half. He would like to see $3 trillion, perhaps he would like to see a budget deficit that is about 30% of the gross domestic product. This was, I have to admit, an incredible shock for me. It took me a little while to uh, digest it, and I confess, even if it makes me appear a little bit weird to you, that some of these things keep me awake at night, still even now. I, uh, I was hard put to come to the explanation as to how it is that we, we could be back where we started. Why are we, why don't they know? Why don't they understand? Uh, and why can't they see it even now when three years after President Obama is elected and the Congress and he have allowed him to uh, create six serious three or four waves of monetary, easy monetary policy and starting at an unemployment rate of 9% after three years it was still 9% and even now after four years is 8.5% and they're speaking about recovery but we need something like the creation in three years of 15 million jobs and this year in America if they create half a million we'll be lucky. Recovery? What recovery? So don't they learn? Well why don't they learn? And ultimately uh, after thinking about it for a little while this is my answer. I came up with what I think is an answer as to why we don't learn from history. Some of which I guess I knew before but just had buried somewhere. Uh, firstly, and I say my answer comes in three parts. Firstly, there is the observation that we are not doing natural science when we do economics. Uh, we are not doing natural science when we do history. We are doing social science. We do not have the luxury of doing controlled experiments. God knows in the physical sciences, controlled experiments and inferences even in some of the natural sciences where controlled experiments are not available but some inferences can be made like maybe astronomy, natural uh, controlled experiments. It is much easier to make inferences, to draw conclusions, to learn lessons, even if not completely decisive, much, much easier. In the social sciences we do not have controlled experiments, we just have the experiments that history gives us. And history does not speak in one voice. Different people looking at the same history, it can be easily proven. Different people looking at the same history will come up with different explanations. That's the one reason is that we don't have the luxury of being able to appeal to knock down arguments. Keynes's story never, loses, never lost its appeal, it never loses its appeal. 
and history can, no history can refute it. Uh, you look at historical events that occur together and you infer correlation and causation in a large number, if not an infinite number of possible ways. Even now, people are interpreting the current events in, in, the, in conformity with Keynes's story. And Keynes's story is appealing. It's very appealing. The people, people in the street have, but they believe that basically when things are going wrong, that it is not only the uh, duty of the government to fix things, but it is also within the government's power. Simply by creating a demand for jobs, the problem being that there's a lack of demand for jobs, you can create jobs. That's a very, very appealing idea. It's easy to refute with logic, if you point out that the create that that perhaps the government cannot create jobs uh, and can only redistribute jobs, the force of that, if you start asking the question, well, how does the government get the money with which to create the jobs, and force people to think about the fact that the government then has, doesn't earn its money, has to get its money from uh, from other uh, ventures that generate value, that add value, and so the resources that are spent in one direction come at the expense of resources spent in another direction. But you see, it took me a little while to explain that, right? If I just uh, stopped at the point of let the government create the jobs, that's much more appealing and much easier to accept. This, the, the, the story of fiscal responsibility is much more difficult to sell. It's much less palatable. It's much better to say to people, we need to spend for prosperity rather than say to people, we need to save and work very hard in order to achieve prosperity. The second reason why we don't learn from history is that memory does not extend well from one generation to another. Uh, the people, when we talk about remembering what happened in the 1970s and 80s, early 80s, and the experience of stagflation and the necessary recession that had to be precipitated before finally unemployment came down, which I remember vividly having lived through it, that memory exists in the current generation only to the extent that they have read about it or to the extent that people have told them about it. And to use a colloquial expression, it's not the same as having been there. You don't remember things that other people tell you from their memory as well as you remember them from your own memory. The previous generation cannot understand or feel the intensity with which the battle for ideas went on during this period and ultimately certain ideas emerged as more plausible or as apparently more likely interpretations of the evidence. So that tragically each generation seems destined to have to relive this experience again before they learn those same lessons. You have to have been there. And my final reason is that, at least as far as education in America is concerned, and I believe in England and other places, and you can speak for your own experiences, there has been a systematic downgrading of the literary subjects that used to constitute what we may call a liberal arts education, including history. So that whereas Certainly in England, when you've got a, 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 a rounded and, and substantial education in philosophy and politics and economics, it had to include history and also in high school. Today, a lot of the people that we're educating in America can graduate at the highest levels and certainly in economics without knowing anything about history. If they know anything, it's tremendously superficial. So that many, uh, it's incredible to me to find that many of my younger colleagues don't know much about what happened, not only in the 1970s, but don't know a whole lot about the Great Depression, and they don't know a whole lot about who John Maynard Keynes was, or any of the leading ancestors, intellectual ancestors of the economic legacy. So the systematic downgrading of the importance of history, it is not surprising that we don't learn from history. So, I think uh, 
where we are today, a result of our not learning history, is uh, basically describable as a classic Austrian cycle. But one that uh, is interpreted again each time anew with each particular economic episode. It starts with a uh, particular technological revolution, like in the 1920s, a series of new technologies, or like in the uh, 90s, 2000, up to 2000, in the introduction of a massively uh, widespread new technology in the form of the information age, which led to a cluster of uh, investments in, uh, in this new tech, in the application of this new technology, not all of which could be sustained. And as a result of this uh, 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 natural, if you like, naturally induced euphoria and optimism and adventurism in the economy, the stuff of which economic growth is made, uh, as a natural result of which the, the, the demand, the competition for loanable funds, the competition for borrowing to invest in these resources results in a pushing up of interest rates. And Friedrich Hayek uh, would have said, the interest rate is the natural, natural break of an economy that is in a boom that is threatening to overshoot. So when the interest rate starts to rise, according to the Austrians and perhaps the monetarists, the best thing to do is to let the interest rate rise to reflect the increasing scarcity of investable funds. But if you're a politician and if you're a central banker that is influenced by a politician, you don't want to be the one that's going to spoil this party. You don't want to be the party pooper. So you, you yield, at least Alan Greenspan did, to the pressure from the politicians to keep the interest rate low. And as a result of a monetary policy that kept the interest rate low, even starting as way back as far as, as, as the late 90s and 2000, we got the overshooting of the telecom boom, investment in, in, in projects that could not be sustained, and eventually crashed in 2000. So the NASDAQ ran up, whereas its peak, it was a multiple of where it ended up. In, in 2000, it came down all the way to there and ultimately gradually, gradually building its way up. But having come through the telecom boom, rebuilding, basically, reshuffling capital combinations, it's not over because the government didn't allow the full market process adjustment that would be necessary for a sustained recovery. Instead, it moved from one new economy to another new economy. The old new economy was based on telecom technology, the new, new economy was based on housing. So as a result of housing policies by which the American dream to own your own house was extended to everybody who lived and breathed, including those who really had no ability and could not afford to live in a house, but according to a very purposeful and long pursued congressional policy, regulatory policy, underwritten by easy central bank policy, we got this massive expl explosion of housing values, which ultimately could only result in a, in a huge crash, a bubble, bursting of the bubble. Which even now is not over, because housing, the housing market is still overbought, even now after four years, and uh, the market, the, the uh, cures, the uh, economic policy, is aimed, designed, among other things, to revive the housing market. So the problem was a housing market in which housing values were too high and in which too many houses had existed. And now the monetary policy and, and, and government policy is trying to revive that housing market. The solution would be to transfer resources out of the housing market to where they can be more profitably employed and the only way that can be done is to allow housing prices to fall to their natural levels. I have a, a list of, um, of uh, uh, recommended policies in case, uh, in case policy makers were to consult me or in case you were to answer, ask the question that is more relevant to the American, to the details of the American market than you may be interested in. But 
It involves, for example, I say, banishing the toxic twins. The toxic twins are Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. These are quasi-government institutions that were designed to subsidize people into houses. They got into debt of extraordinary, in extraordinary proportion, hundreds of billions of dollars. They got into debt at the taxpayer's expense, and they still live. They're still alive. It's the brainchild of a couple of congressmen, one in particular whose name is Barney Frank, and he is still in Congress, uh, and who, under any uh, rational system of justice, would rather be sitting, should rather be sitting in jail. But his influence hasn't waned, and uh, as long as it hasn't, and as long as that kind of thing continues, we're going to have problems. We will need to re-establish sound principles of mortgage lending, stop easy money, uh, and uh, 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 <coughs> reduce taxation in other forms. Inflation is one form of taxation. Other forms of taxation level uh, taxation has been going up uniformly for many years, and as a result, really, some of part of the problem of the malaise in which American economy now finds itself. Let the market determine interest rates. Ultimately, for the long term, sound, is try and establish a sound money policy, one in which money is free from unexpected money supply volatility. And for the long run, maybe, find a way to abolish central banks. That's the sort of utopian dream. Uh, I added a little bit about Europe because I thought this may be of more interest to you. I don't have the same level of expertise about the European situation, but maybe I'll offer a few, more, uh, a few uh, observations. The uh, European situation is even more complicated because of the fact that it involves so many interconnected e uh, economies. And uh, much attention is being devoted these days, perhaps every day, to the question of the European Currency Union and the uh, possibility of default of the uh, one or more of the members, debt default of one or more of the members of the members of the currency union. Uh, the, the, in a nutshell, the currency union is being pulled in different directions by the spenders and by the growers, you might say. The way to get out of a debt situation, and there, there's, there are only a finite number of ways, among which there are to grow the economy uh, or to try and spend your way out and uh, the, uh, there is a push and pull going on with, within the members of the European Currency Union and uh, this thre is threatening to pull that union apart unless there becomes some alignment of the uh, policies in fact we probably cannot expect the currency union to survive but uh, it, it raises the question in my mind about whether or not a common currency area needs a currency union right it doesn't necessarily, we don't necessarily need an agreement between the governments of a particular area in order to have the people living in those areas use a common currency. All we need to do is allow people the choice to choose what currency they want. And uh, it's one thing that may be hoped for is that even if, for example, Greece decides as an official, the Greek government decides as an official uh, act, to leave the currency union that it may leave its citizens free to use whatever currency they want and they may continue to use the euro in which case greek monetary policy would be rendered totally impotent and that would be something welcome for many people although it would be painful for 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 people who have benefited from government largesse in that economy uh, so i i say that maybe it's not necessary to have a, a currency choice does not imply that you have to have a currency union to get the benefits of common usage of a currency. Because there are definite benefits. The basic ideas that underlie the uh, co common currency union project, I think, are sound. The fact that a larger area can derive the benefits of trading in the same currency are, are pretty large, are potentially very high. I don't think that can be denied. So, uh, ultimately though, of course, it will involve a change in the way that governments finance welfare and finance the other things within their economies. And as I look at the European situation, you can correct me, I don't see any fundamental change taking place. So that we seem to be sort of 
deciding not to make a decision in that regard. But they seem to be deciding not to decide, just letting things take their course. And uh, I'm not one of those economists who makes predictions. Uh, they are saying, I don't think uh, we can predict these things, and we certainly, I don't think we can predict the future very well, and we certainly can't predict the future of, po of, po of policy, of, politi of politics. So, when will we ever learn? And if we do, will it be too late? Let me end, somewhat ironically, with a quote from John Maynard Keynes that I think is particularly appropriate to this particular topic. He said, the ideas of economists and political philosophers, both when they are right and when they are wrong, are more powerful than is commonly understood. Indeed, the world is ruled by little else. Practical men who believe themselves to be quite exempt from any intellectual influences are usually the slaves of some defunct economist. Mad men in authority who hear voices in the air are distilling their frenzy from some academic scribbler of a few years back. Thank you very much. <laughs> Questions or comments? British universities, and uh, I came from the background of urban planning. So I was researching land exchanges, housing, throughout Europe. And uh, more and more and more, I was uh, figuring out that the problems are different. We're fighting against results, not the reasons. Uh, you, you said uh, rightly that uh, history is forgotten very often. Unfortunately, there was uh, uh, history forgotten from 19th century, not from 20th century, first of all. Uh, the problems were much better identified in 19th century. They were more visible there because they were less uh, missed, economical missed before 20th century. Uh, the problem is that uh, there was um, uh, there was Lincoln's uh, monetary system, Abraham Lincoln's in 60s, 1860s, and later, up to 10, 15 years later, there was Henry George, who was also analyzed uh, the, the fundamental problems, what created uh, the problems in uh, end of 19th century, and then Keynes and uh, then uh, Austrian School of Economics, they added their part of uh, researching the problems. Uh, both Keynes and uh, uh, Austrian School of Economics, they were right, uh, but partially that was a problem. Uh, without each other's ideas, they were both wrong in some, way, in some way. And it was much more easily visible from 19th century than from 21st century, even. paradoxically, it's like this. Uh, I've been writing the book about uh, uh, the, the universal model, which is unifying all the different ideas. And it starts that first and most important problem is the fraction reserve system of money. It is distorting the reality of economics. And because of that, a lot of problems is created. And Keynes was trying to fix these problems. He failed for some reasons. And then Austrian schools of uh, economy was trying to, to fix the, the second part of problem. And they also failed in some way. Uh, that's, that's my conclusion and not only mine. So the point is that first of all you need to, to fix the money system and then you fix uh, the natural resource ownership of rent issue and then Austrian School of Economics is the best way to, to, to finalize the problem. Without fundament there is impossible to write, uh, impossible to, to, to build the building itself. Austrian School of Economics is excellent because it empowers markets to build the building, but if you don't have foundation, which I call money, and which I call natural resource, rent, and land use, uh, capturing land use values, there is no, there is in vain everything. So the Keynes uh, ideology is coming back, and it will be failed again, and it will be Australian economies coming back again, it will fail again, at least we, we find the, the way where it all starts, it's money, fraction reserve system, business cycles are reasons of that. Hi. Okay, thank you. I, that's very interesting. Um, I, uh, 
I can't comment on everything that you said, and I look forward to reading your book. Um, from what you said uh, of Keynes, or the elements of Keynes' policy, uh, some of which are combined with Austrian to give a more accurate picture, uh, I, it's, that's not the Keynes that I know, so maybe there's something else in Keynes that addressed the question of fractional reserve banking that I don't know about. Uh, but I have never really associated Keynes with the propagation, propagation of a sound uh, financial or monetary system. Even after uh, the general theory and his participation in the reconstruction of the world, of the war, excuse me, the reconstruction of the world financial system after the war, uh, he had a vision of a world money, a world bank, that was uh, not really based on any kind of fundamental anchor. So maybe you're referring to something a little different, uh, but certainly what you say about, uh, <coughs> about the American ideas, I think of Henry George you referred to, and some others, that's very interesting. Uh, maybe a word, a quick word on fractional reserve banking. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, there is a, currently a somewhat of a debate going on among Austrians about the uh, desirability or viability of fractional reserve banking versus 100% reserve banking. I'm not sure uh, in this audience if you know exactly what that is, but roughly speaking, fractional reserve banking is the kind of banking we have today in which when you deposit money in the bank, you know that the bank is going to use some of that money to make loans to somebody else. 100% uh, reserve banking would be if they kept $100 would you deposit with them as $100 in reserves. That would be 100% uh, reserves. Uh, my own uh, research in this area and relying on the work of some of my esteemed colleagues, Larry White, George Selgin and some others, is that I uh, firm, do firmly believe that fractional reserve banking is not responsible for business cycles. In fact, quite the opposite. That fractional reserve banking is a natural adaptation of the, uh, of the free market. It's, a, it's, a, it's one of the adaptations of a complex adaptive monetary system. Uh, I don't think it's fraudulent and I don't think it is uh, disruptive and I think it actually works counter cyclically. So I know that there are some who agree, who disagree completely and I guess they have their own reasons um, but I'm sure we can't resolve that here and now. Right. Hello. Uh, thank you again uh, for your lecture. Um, I'm really very interested in uh, healthcare economy, and uh, as we know, oh, this Obamacare is. Uh, uh, going away in the United States um, uh, and uh, there are some thoughts that it is wrong, some thoughts that it's a very good idea and so on. Uh, and uh, in Georgia we also have uh, something like a Keynesian economy coming back because in two, after 2003 it was more a uh, libertarian approach which uh, was more dominating and then now uh, almost every week uh, our president is uh, opening hospitals and saying it is the good idea if uh, insurance companies uh, will uh, open these hospitals so they will remain the government. Uh, so uh, I don't know it's a good idea and I think that uh, somehow we should explain to people uh, that something wrong is going on. but. Uh, as you already said, it's very difficult to explain um, because people like uh, to believe popular ideas, populist ideas, actually. And uh, you said a lot of, uh, uh, you were talking about a lot of problems, uh, but uh, uh, what I'm missing here is what is the solution? What should be done to approve once again the Keynesian approach is wrong? And uh, more uh, free market economies, uh, correct way of doing things. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Uh, that's also very interesting. I'm sorry to hear that there seems to be a kind of a Keynesian spring break here in Georgia as well. And I hope that it's uh, short-lived. Um, yes, Obamacare. <laughs> um, if you had a week, I couldn't explain to you the complexities, even if I knew. I couldn't explain to you the complexities and the problems of the American healthcare system. Uh, it is a case of controls heaped upon controls heaped upon controls that now, at the end of the day, there are no markets in healthcare left in America, but just a series of different layers of controls and subsidies and mandates. And now with Obamacare, we're getting price controls and central committees. The, a diagram on Obamacare would, would fill a whole slide and make it look like a spider web of all the different uh, decision-making areas and components of the healthcare equation. Um, so I don't know how to answer the question of how to reform them, how even be to begin to reform the American healthcare system. Uh, but the one thing they could do is, uh, one thing we could do in the beginning is to repeal Obamacare immediately. It hasn't, it's, it, it gets implemented only very gradually. Ultimately, it will result in a almost total nationalization of the healthcare system. Uh, that will be paid for, who knows exactly how, but in some form of prohibitive taxation. So, uh, one is hoping that even if Obama does get elected again, which it looks increasingly likely that he will, that at least one hopes that the Congress might be powerful enough to resist the implementation of the details of Obamacare and eventually repeal it. Now, as regards your problem, I don't know how advanced uh, healthcare and the subsidization of healthcare is, but if you're at a less advanced situation, then it may you may have an opportunity to resist. I don't know. In America, there is a Paul Ryan, who is the head of the House Banking Committee, Budget Committee, uh, in the Congress, has a, a, a plan, a really good plan for moving back from Obamacare, that recognizes the difficulty of persuading people that the government should not be involved at all in healthcare. Uh, that would be my view, of course, that people should be encouraged, uh, you know, to take to to take care of this themselves. I understand that, uh, especially in America now, with the cost of healthcare, but maybe worldwide, the cost of healthcare in America high as a result of regulation, in part. But in many other places, I have Japanese students who go home between semesters in order to see their doctors back in Japan and to get surgery there because it's so much cheaper than getting it in America. Um, and I understand that not everybody can afford, even in, the, in places where it doesn't cost so much, uh, but in a system in which we don't have government involvement, we have, would have widespread private charitable activities for helping people who need health care, as they did in the 19th century before we had massive government involvement. But given that we have the situation that we have now, where people cannot be persuaded that the government is not going to be involved in things like healthcare and education, we have to look for second best solutions, right? Second best solutions are much more difficult than first best solutions. That some people like to retreat to the luxury of saying, oh no, that's no good because the government's still involved, we need to do this. But the first best solution may not be available my prime example is the use of school vouchers rather than school production, than the production of education. So I believe the same kind of thing might be available in healthcare. Is that the government doesn't have to produce healthcare in order to subsidize it. The government doesn't have to produce healthcare in order to ensure people a certain basic. The government can subsidize consumers and allow the product to be produced competitively. It's not, a, it's not the first best solution, but it's a better solution. Private hospitals and I'm surprised for me, surprised I didn't hear about it. They are um, governmental hospitals? Uh, hospitals they open? Are, they are not, but uh, they are opened uh, with the agreement uh, from government. That's like acceptable. They give it up with nothing, but they are private, they are built by 
private money and they are working on the base of private... Uh... I'm very much... Uh... Okay, that's something another, but I was a little bit surprised. I, didn't I think that, 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 that they, these insurance companies will not be opening this uh, hospital without this uh, agreement with government. It's, uh, it's some kind of government project which is running on uh, around the whole uh, country. And what is uh, even worse, uh, it is some kind of lending system. But it because what I'm... Uh, by the, the money of the taxpayers uh, is much more important. It's uh, actually taxpayers' money because uh, yes. uh, what uh, uh, happened actually, uh, mm, uh, it was some kind of uh, insurance uh, uh, company are running on, then it failed by these insurance companies. Then, uh, to punish these uh, insurance companies, government uh, uh, for them to open hospitals now, uh, instead to, uh, of uh, how, how to, uh, in a way, how to get this money back. And uh, uh, what is uh, even more, uh, even worse, yeah, because uh, what I would, uh, think uh, it is some kind of lending system, because there is no free competition here. Uh, uh, these uh, you know, parts of the Georgian uh, you know, lands, uh, Georgian uh, country, are divided between I don't know how many uh, insurance companies, and these insurance companies are not competing with each other uh, in, in uh, uh, this land. Um, people can choose the place. No, they can't. Can they can't. Can I say something? <laughs> um, this is an interesting discussion and a very interesting discussion. And I understand, I understand your point of view, <coughs> and, excuse me, and yours. Um, but the the the, the uh, situation that Georgia is in is is coming at it from the other side. We already in America have a system of socialized medicine, and we're getting somebody to propose to desocialize it, not completely, but somewhat to where it where consumption is subsidized but not production. You're coming from the other end. You're coming from the end where maybe you had a private system and then the government is coming in and maybe starting to subsidize or maybe to start making alliances with people, or regulate and make alliances with people in the private sector. There is a strong argument again, but in which basically is a, a kind of a central planning. I understand your fear. Um, but all I was saying is, yeah, that maybe we need, while guarding against that, and particularly if you're coming from the other end, it's better to start to worrying about uh, people who would die if they didn't have a minimum level of health care. So you give them a voucher that guarantees that they can get that access. That will, that's the sort of minimum level of involvement that maybe you can persuade people about. Good. Thank you all very much.